Welcome to this video. The next main topic of the course is how to find eigenvalues and eigenvectors of a matrix numerically. So we will study this problem from a point of view of numerical mathematics and we will also look at a couple of different methods to find eigenvalues. The most basic method is the power method and that will give you one eigenvalue and eigenvector, an eigenpair. Then we will try to extend it to find multiple eigenvalues. And the last algorithm that we will cover is the QR algorithm to find eigenvalues. And that is the standard method to compute all the eigenvalues in a very cheap and numerically stable way of a matrix. But first, let's look at a little introduction. And let's see the topics for this uh, presentation. So I would like to start with a link to a YouTube video showing why eigenvalues are important. There are many, many different applications and one very famous example where an eigenvalue analysis, an eigenmode analysis could have been very useful is the Tacoma Narrows Bridge disaster. Then I will sketch generally how eigenvalue problems work. And for this video, I would like to state a couple of results we know just from linear algebra on the eigenvalues of a matrix. So if you just have the matrix, can you in advance, in a simple way, already say something about the location of the eigenvalues in the complex plane? Because in general, even for a real matrix, we will have complex eigenvalues. So let's see. First of all, I would normally show this video, but here is a link to YouTube. So pause this video and watch the video that I've linked to here. And it shows you the little story. It's a very short video. I'm not sure how long, but I think about 10 minutes or even less than that. And it shows very nicely how eigenmode analysis, finding eigenvalues and eigenvectors can be important to real world applications. So I won't say too much about it here. I will go to the next slides and talk about the general mathematics but this is a nice video, so please have a look at it. So eigenvalue problems, of course you've seen those before. So given is a square matrix and we are trying to find vectors x such that a times x equals lambda times x. Now x cannot be the zero vector because then it would say a times zero equals zero. That is not interesting. So x needs to be unequal to zero. However, if we can find a non-zero vector x such that ax equals the zero vector, then that is very interesting. So lambda equals zero, that is allowed. The eigenvector cannot be the zero vector. Eigenvalues can be zero. If a matrix has eigenvalue zero, it doesn't have an inverse, it is a singular matrix. So the eigenvector may not be the zero vector, but the eigenvalue lambda can be zero. If lambda is an eigenvalue, then A is singular. And we have already seen in a previous video that if you um, take an induced matrix norm, so a vector norm induces a matrix norm, and in particular we have the one matrix norm, two matrix norm, and we have the infinity matrix norm. They all give an upper bound for the spectral radius and the spectral radius is the largest eigenvalue if you look at absolute values. So if you take all the eigenvalues and you take the absolute value, then it's always bounded by any induced matrix norm. So that already tells us something about the location of the eigenvalues in the complex plane. But we can narrow it down more specific. And for that, we need Gershgorin's circle theorem. So the idea here is to try and locate the eigenvalues in the complex plane. So let's assume here more general that we have a complex matrix. So A is a complex n times n matrix. And <clears throat> for every row, I'm going to define Ri which is the sum of the absolute value of the matrix entries, but we sum over the off diagonal entries. So here you see that J should be unequal to I. So the diagonal entry is not included, but we only sum per, per row 
the off diagonal enter is. Then I'm going to make disks and those disks called bi here have as their center in the complex plane the diagonal entry and then as a radius this ri. So for every row of the matrix what I'm going to do is I'm going to locate the diagonal entry in the complex plane and then I'm going to draw a little circle around it and that circle has radius sum of the absolute value of the off diagonal entries. Now the claim is that for every eigenvalue of the matrix you can find such a disk and they are called Gershgorin disks such that lambda is in this disk. So here in the picture on the right you see for apparently a 5x5 five five matrix you see that we have uh, plotted these five disks and for every eigenvalue we can find a disk that contains it. It is not true that every single disk needs to contain one of the eigenvalues. That is not true. I will give a slightly sharper version on the next slide. But here it just says if you have an eigenvalue I can find a disk that contains it. So let's see if we can prove it because it says here that we will prove this theorem. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take an eigenvalue and then I'm going to find a disk that contains it. So let's see. So let's lambda be an eigenvalue of the matrix, so of A. So of course then I can find an eigenvector. So let u be unequal to zero such that a u equals lambda u. So u is an eigenvector for the eigenvalue lambda. And now, well, if you look at the theorem, then it has all these all these entries in here and also the diagonal entry. So what I'm going to do is I am going to consider this equation a u equals lambda u into its components. So what I have is then well a times u if you then take component i that equals the sum j equals 1 up to n a i j so those are the matrix entries u j so this is component i of the vector a times u and on the right hand side we have a lambda u i and that should hold for every component because the two factors are the same so every component needs to be the same so for all i is one two up to the matrix size so up to n so if I split off on the left, if I write a sum as the sum of the off diagonal entries plus the diagonal entry, so let's do that, then I can write that will just fit. So the sum j is 1 up to n and j should be unequal to i, a i j u j. Plus, of course, then the diagonal entry, a i i u i equals lambda u i. And that holds again for all i. I'm not going to copy that. So just moving everything with i to the right hand side of the equation and copying what we have. Let's do that on a new page. What we have then is that um, apparently the sum j equals 1 j e does not equal i up to n a i j u j should equal lambda u i minus a i i u i and you see that this already starts looking a little bit like these Gershgorin disks but now I'm going to take a special one so I am now going to take, so I'm going to choose M such that 
if I take the infinity norm of u, that that equals um absolute value. So as you know, the infinity norm is if you take all the components of the vector, then absolute values, and then the biggest one. So I can find such an m. And then what we have is that, um, let's see, lambda minus a m m times u m equals the sum j equals 1, j is not equal to m up to n a um, m j u j. So basically what I did here is I applied the equation that we derived here that holds for every single i I choose i equal to m here in this equation. Okay. So now let's divide by u m. So this is the sum j is 1, j not equal to m up to n, a m j u j over u m and now i'm going to take absolute values and then you see that the reason that i picked the maximum one here is that the absolute value of these fractions are going to be less than one so taking absolute values we find that absolute value lambda minus a m m is less or equal sum j is 1, j unequal to m up to n, a m j times the absolute value of u j over u m, but I'm not going to write them down because they're less or equal 1. So I only make it bigger if I skip them here, if I don't write them down. And basically what we have found now, so conclusion, conclusion, a lambda is an element of Bm. So the gas core in disk that corresponds to entry M, to row M of the matrix. Okay. So that concludes the proof of this Gashgorin theorem. Now there is one more note here on the slide, which is that if you are working with a real matrix, so I assumed we have a complex matrix, if you assume that your matrix is real, then all the diagonal entries are also real, of course, which means that all these disks have as a center a point on the real axis. So they're, they all... Um, the centers of the Gashkor and disk lie then on, on the real axis. Now, I already said there is a bit of a stronger version of Gershgorin's theorem, and that tells that if you can divide the disks into multiple sets, here I drew two sets, so I'm going to assume that our matrix is n times n again, so in principle it has n eigenvalues, and say that we have a set here of three of them which are partially overlapping but are completely disjunct from the red ones here so there is also a set of n minus k disks here are k disk here are n minus k disks then what you do know if they do not overlap these two sets the black and the red disks is that k of the eigenvalues lie in the union of these disks and n minus k of the eigenvalues lie here so um, it is still not saying that every disk has an eigenvalue, but it is a bit sharper than what we had on the previous slide. And a corollary of this, and you've probably already seen this in the past, but if you have a diagonal matrix, then the um, entries on the diagonal are the eigenvalues. And it's very easy to see. You could take the unit vectors E1, E2. They are the eigenvectors here. You can immediately see that. But you could also use Kersgorin's theorem because the, the disks, the Kersgorin disks, 
they are now just one point because they have a radius zero. So the disks have one point and they are in, if they are in different locations, then you know that they're all separate. And if they're separate, they contain precisely one eigenvalue. So a few more remarks. Um, we have already seen in, in previous videos that a matrix and its transpose have the same eigenvalues if you have a square matrix. Um, so you could apply Gorin and get the disks that correspond to the rows as it was originally formulated, but you could also apply Gorin circle theorem on the transpose. And if you do that, in principle, you're working on, um, you're working on the columns of the matrix. So you can also look at the column sum and that gives you some, can give you some sharper estimates for the eigenvalues. You have a better idea of where they're located in a complex plane. Also, if you have a real matrix, the eigenvalues can still be complex. The only thing that you do know is that if you are dealing with a symmetric matrix, then you know that the eigenvalues are real. So that wraps up this first introductory video. What we have seen is that you can estimate the eigenvalues using induced matrix norms. So the, the one, two, the infinity norm, they give an upper bound for all the eigenvalues. And we have seen a sharper estimate in the form of Kirsch-Corkin's circle theorem. So nothing about numerical methods yet. That will be the topic of future videos. But this was an introduction showing you why eigenvalues are important. And that without doing many computations, you can already have an idea of where the eigenvalues are located. So that wraps up this video and I'll happily see you in the next one.